Let's pray. Loving God, Heavenly Father, we do really thank you for these times. You enable us to study thy word. Lord, you, <clears throat> you brought your servant to our midst uh, to teach us what you have uh, written in your word. And Lord, may you help, help us to understand uh, better in our life and use our professor too, so that we may use uh, something from his uh, teaching and we may apply in our life so that we may be able to work for your own glory more and more. I pray this in your mighty care. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, one or two quick words about what's coming up. So next time we come together, today's Monday, Thursday. Uh, when we come back together on Thursday, we will spend time thinking about the role of logic in theology. And I, I'm drawing a lot of those ideas from my dissertation, but but other ideas as well. So the basic question we'll be exploring is, um, how do you defend the legitimate use of logic? How do you recognize the illegitimate use of logic? Uh, how do you proceed once you're working through this? You can't not use logic. You will use logic. How do you proceed? Um, in the meantime, then let me give you the last two lectures. Are The following lecture will be what we do final questions you've joined, joined in the classes before, you are familiar with that method. Um, I need, I do need your help there, and in the past I've asked each person to give me at least uh, two questions. Um, you know, I'm sure that you have lots more than that. Um, so anyway, we've covered a lot of topics. There's plenty to ask about. You could ask ten questions from our discussion tonight, I'm sure. Uh, but I would love to get your questions, and really what we do during that time is directly taken from your questions. So please help me out. Uh, give me some of the things that you're struggling with, wondering about. You can drop that into the forum um, on our page. Actually, maybe I'll pull that up during the break and show you. And you can do it that way. You can direct message me. I don't care. You could chat me right, right during our time tonight. Um, and then I'll prepare those for a week from tonight. And then our final class I'll talk about next time, but I want us to do some case studies. So it's theological method this time around. I've been writing a couple of um, intentionally complicated situations that I want you to apply an entire theological method to thinking through and processing. Okay, that's all coming up. Just wanted to give you a heads up. And when we finish that out, that finishes, that finishes our course together. Introducing our speaker tonight. Um, so I'm delighted with the opportunity. Well, this year, I should say, <laughs> in May. Um, and the title of his dissertation, uh, Bringing Many Sons to Glory, a Biblical Theological Investigation of the Intersection of Sonship and Resurrection and its Implications for Filial Christ Christology, Including the Christological Significance of the Prototokos Title. So we've got a lot to talk through there. I'm sure he's going to cover all of this tonight and um, answer any of our questions, solve all of our problems. I've looked forward to this. I wanted to get him here because I wanted to hear him talk through this topic because it's it's a little bit hot right now and it's something I'm really interested in. <laughs> so uh, maybe a little bit selfishly I asked him to come and it's not selfishly that because we're going to enjoy the time here. So Dr. Minnick looking forward to what you'll give us and the time is yours. We'll go until an hour from now and then take a five minute break and uh, then just finish out until 10 o'clock. Yep. Can you hear me okay? Sounds great. Okay. Sounds very good. Great. And if I, I had a PowerPoint here, um, I've actually never really taught with Zoom before. I've always used Teams. Um, how would I share the PowerPoint so that everyone can see it and sure. still see me? Is, is that an option? Absolutely. So you'll just go down, share screen, and then uh, you're going to get a window with a bunch of, you can choose any of the windows that are open on your machine. Okay. Gotcha. So if I, um, let's see here. Back if you like this. Um, okay, so can you all see the, the PowerPoint then? It's great. And also see me? Yes. Okay. Great. Perfect. All righty, we'll jump in. Yes, well, my name is um, 
is Andrew Minnick. I grew up in Australia, so over on your side of the world, and I spent actually some time um, in several countries in Southeast Asia, and I really enjoyed my time there, and I've been looking forward to this time to get together with you and uh, share some of what the Lord has taught me over the last few years. It's been an exciting topic, very devotional, um, very spiritual. It's really warmed my heart and just, it's been a blessing. Um, and I've also been looking forward to your feedback. Um, I know when I, when I was studying this, I felt like I was barely scratching the surface. And uh, every chance I get, I try to share it with people and then ask them to tell me what they think and to, uh, uh, you know, help align my thinking more closely with that of God and understand these passages a little bit more um, in line with his thinking. And so I would appreciate your feedback if you wanted to send me an email afterwards with thoughts or additional passages or insights or questions. Um, I would I would love that. Um, but in order to give honor to whom honor is due, I feel like I should acknowledge my research assistant. Um, and uh, hopefully you all can, can you see the picture of my son there in the PowerPoint? Then, okay. So he, this is my son, Seth. And as I was working on this, this is actually from a few years ago, he came in one night and he wanted to, um, to kind of, you know, cuddle up and read his book while I was working on my dissertation. And I just thought, how, how wonderful is this? Here I am writing about sonship of God. And here's my son coming to, uh, to want to be with his dad. And it, it just uh, impressed to me um, that night how personal and how, um, uh, how emotional of a topic this is for God. He went to incredible lengths that we might become his children um, and this is something that's very near and dear to his heart. And so, you know, it's an academic topic, but it's also very devotional. Um, and it's exactly, um, you know, it, it's something that God cares very, very deeply about. And so I wanted to, to just kind of begin on that note. Here he is kind of trying to help me out with the, with the research and stuff. Um, but hopefully this will be a blessing to you as we think about it today. So I... Um, I wanted to just kind of talk a little bit about the genesis of the topic and my my interest in it. Um, it started about um, probably six or seven years ago when I started noticing throughout scripture um, that sonship and resurrection were linked together in a lot of different passages. Um, you know, the most obvious would be like Romans 8, where we're told that the redemption of our body is our huyothesia or our adoption. Um, and so the two are linked together. And, and it's not just that they're linked together, but in some sense, um, we come to be sons of God by resurrection. You know, you think about Romans 8, 23, there's, Paul defines the adoption as being the redemption of our bodies. And so in some way, resurrection actually makes us to be sons. Um, you think about like Luke 20, 36, and it says there, that in the resurrection, it says we'll be like angels, which is a statement of comparison, and then we'll actually be sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. And it seems to be a, a causal participle there. Because we're sons of the resurrection, um, we will be sons of God. And so in some sense, the resurrection actually makes us to be, um, to be children of God. So I start noticing this connection between the two. Um, and I, so I, I did some reading, and I, I found that people, when they spoke of the resurrection imparting sonship, they would speak of resurrection as being an adoption, um, which is an, a, a forensic event. And in that forensic event, um, one is made legally a child, or one is given the rights of sonship. Um, and people would speak about the resurrection as being our adoption. And so the theological intersection of the two would be explained as the resurrection is the event by which God adopts us to become, um, to become his children and adopts us into sonship. Um, but that explanation didn't really satisfy me. And the reason it didn't is because there's a lot of, of times in the scripture um, that the resurrection is spoken of as an ontological um, as an ontological change. And really, it is an ontological change. You know, when we think of 
of the idea of ontology, we're thinking about what a person is, as opposed to their relationships, as opposed to their function, as opposed to what they possess. You know, ontology is what we actually are. And resurrection isn't just a legal declaration. Um, resurrection isn't just a, a bestowal of rights. Resurrection actually changes what we are specifically our bodies, it's an ontological change. And so talking about the resurrection as an adoption or as something legal just, just didn't really seem to explain what was going on there. Um, so the resurrection is a change in our ontology, particularly our, our material ontology. It's not just a change of legal status. Um, and if what happens at the resurrection is merely just a change in legal status, if it really is just an adoption, then it's just a coincidence that it happens at resurrection. Um, God could easily, just as easily, have made the legal declaration at some other event in the future. You know, you think about everything that's going to happen in the future um, to a believer. There's um, entrance into God's presence at death. Um, there's entering into the eternal state. There's a lot of different events. And um, you know, God could very well have have made that legal declaration at any one of those events, and it's just a coincidence that it happened at resurrection. And it seemed like in Scripture there was a whole lot tighter of a connection than just merely coincidence, that the two happened to occur at the same point in time. Um, so I went looking, and, um, you know, I found that these passages talk about the ontological, ontological change of our bodies, um, as being an actual entrance into, into sonship. Um, the redemption of our bodies is not just the timing of our huyothesia or of our entrance into sonship. It actually is our huyothesia. In some way, transforming our bodies by resurrection is itself an entrance into sonship. Um, and so that was the research question of how the, two, um, how the two relate to each other and what the theological connection is. And when you think about Christ's experience, you know, I, I think I sent you all some, some passages that you were going to look at beforehand. Um, but in Acts 13, uh, you know, we're told that Christ was begotten by resurrection. Psalm 2-7 is quoted there. Um, he's called the firstborn um, in, in Romans 8-29 in a context of, of resurrection. In Colossians, 118, he's called the firstborn from the dead. The same thing again in Revelation 1, 5, he's the firstborn from the dead. Um, and so these, these birth terms are ontological. They're not just a legal declaration. Um, and so not only for us, but also for Christ, there's something ontological going on here, whereby the actual change um, of the body in resurrection is in some sense an entrance into sonship in and of itself. Um, and I found that a lot of people just, they don't really address Acts 13.33 and the beginning terminology when they talk about this question. Um, and when they talk about firstborn and those passages, a lot of times they explain firstborn as just signifying um, preeminence or the first in rank. And they don't, um, they don't want to say that it's, it's literally talking about actual sonship, that, that the birth part of the term is, is actually, is actually literal. Um, the problem with that is that in Romans 8, firstborn is, uh, is used there in conjunction with the idea of brethren. He's, he's the firstborn that he might be the, uh, that he might be among many brethren. And so there's obviously some kind of family idea to firstborn. Um, it's not just preeminence. Um, and so I demonstrate, you know, throughout the dissertation that the other uses of firstborn as well in Hebrews and in Revelation also are, um, are encapsulating the same Christology that it is literally talking about a birth and an entrance into sonship, not, not just preeminence. Um, so if the scripture speaks about resurrection as a birth, which is an ontological change, you know, the question that's going through my mind is, well, then why do people talk about it as being just an adoption? You know, and I don't know, can you, can you think, why would, why would someone talk about the resurrection as being an adoption? And the answer is, is the term that Paul uses in Romans 8. He uses the term huyothesia, 
um, which was used in secular culture for um, a lot of times an adoptive process where you would take someone into your family who wasn't naturally a son, um, they weren't ontologically a son, and you would legally make them to be a son. And because Paul equates that term with the redemption of our bodies in Romans 8.23, you can see why people would want to talk about the resurrection as an adoption um, and to talk about it as being a legal or a, a forensic idea. Um, and certainly there are legal things that are going on. There's rights of sonship. Um, but my contention is that that's not all that's going on. Yes, God does give us the rights of sonship, but he does it by ontologically making us sons. He naturally makes us sons by means of birth. Not that he legally adopts us as sons in spite of a lack of natural sonship. Um, and so really, you know, I, I think you all read kind of the introductory part of the, of the dissertation there. Um, and really at the heart of the question is in what sense Christ's resurrection was a beginning into sonship, all right? And this is where it gets a little bit sticky because we know that from all eternity, he's been the son of God, all right? At least from, from pre-incarnate state. And, uh, and we know that he's been full deity um, from eternity past. So how can one who is the son of God be begotten ontologically into sonship? Um, and uh, so what do we do with this begetting term in, in Acts 13? What do we do with the term firstborn? Um, you know, and how do, we, how do we explain that? And traditionally, I think you all read the first part of the dissertation, and I had a little chart there um, where people have explained this question of, of sonship from eternity past and yet sonship entered into by resurrection and they've explained that tension in one of in one of three ways on the left side of the chart you can see some people will hold to only pre-incarnate sonship and and it's because they they want to avoid the heresy of adoptionism and so they'll hold that the resurrection merely proved or declared what was already true and so when the scriptures talk about begetting by resurrection or use the term firstborn um, it's talking about simply a declaration of the sonship that was already possessed that he had from eternity past um, completely on the other side you've got where john macarthur went and he held that sonship was a functional role um, that it didn't have anything really to do with ontology it was a functional role um, that was not possessed from eternity past but was something that Christ assumed in the incarnation. And in other words, it, it was, a, it was uh, something that pertained only to the incarnation, and it was a functional role that Christ took on um, with the Father. Um, but in the middle, you've got what a man at Westminster proposed, and actually other people have proposed it, but he kind of has, has developed it, and that is that there really are two senses of Christ's sonship. Uh, the first um, is is an ontological sonship that was possessed from eternity past. Um, and then there's a functional or a, a messianic or an Adamic sonship. And that was what culminated at the resurrection. And you can see he's differentiating between an ontological sonship and a functional sonship. All right. And so what he does is, is he builds off of this whole idea of, of the resurrection being an adoption being a functional or a legal matter, not an ontological matter, but a functional or, or a legal matter. Um, and, and on that basis, then he talks about our resurrection being our adoption into sonship. And, and then he talks about Christ as the prototype being adopted into functional sonship that pertains to his righteousness um, and his life lived under God's law. Um, and so Garner takes this center position, and he does recognize two different senses of sonship, but he, he, he relegates um, the, the human sense of sonship to being merely a functional matter, not an ontological matter. And so my dissertation um, has attempted to, to advance Garner's work by developing the ontological sense of Christ's human sonship. Um, and in that way, I try to explain um, what is meant when the scripture says that he was begotten by resurrection. Um, 
in Acts 13, uh, when the Tartakos term is used, it says that he's the firstborn from the dead. He's the firstborn that he might be among many brethren. Um, trying to understand um, the ontological, um, the ontological sense of that of that birth terminology, um, and and demonstrate that this is not just a matter of adoption. This is a matter also of um, of actual birth. Um, so hopefully that kind of makes sense. That's a little bit of the genesis of the of the topic and how I came to to have interest in it and where I feel like my my research fits into the larger picture of taking what Dr. Garner proposed and and trying to trying to modify slightly his understanding of this second sense of Christ's sonship that was taken on um, in the incarnation and culminated by resurrection um, and understanding it not merely as a functional or a legal matter of adoption but being um, a matter of actual ontology, um, a matter of birth. Um, so that was that. That's kind of the the genesis. I wanted to take a second and just talk a little bit about the methodology. You know, how would you go about investigating uh, this question? You've got a question of okay, we've got we got resurrection, we got sonship, and the two are tied together. Resurrection in some way imparts sonship. So how would you go about investigating um, that question? Uh, and it's a question of theological method and how you formulate theology. Um, and the the methodology that I've been taught here at, at BJU Seminary is is starting with biblical theology and then building towards systematic theology, and the two complement one another. And so in the first place, um, this study has to be uh, about biblical theology, you know, walking through scripture, locating passages that speak of the intersection of these themes. You know, what passages do we have that, that talk about the two and how they relate to each other, sonship and resurrection, um, and then writing about it, you know, what the, what the passage talks about. And I was telling somebody recently that I think a biblical theology is, is one of the best dissertations to write because essentially you're just kind of going through finding passages that address your topic, studying them and then writing about them. Um, and it's, it really is a very, a very devotional um, exercise. Um, and one of the things I thought I'd just take a, a break here and, and show you what I did with one of these passages. You can see here, I've got, this is Romans eight. And I took the passage and I, um, kind of made sort of a clause display, and then I went through and highlighted themes in different colors. Um, and this really helped me as I came to individual passages to trace these themes through the passage um, to sort of use coloration. And you could do it even just with colored pencils or something. Um, but it really helped me to be able to, to trace my way uh, through these passages. So, so this topic had to be developed as a biblical theology, but it also then had to move towards systematic theology. Um, there had to be an increasing synthesis um, moving through the progressive revelation of scripture. And so each passage um, was allowed to draw upon the conclusions and the discoveries made in previous passages, because these authors wrote with previous revelation in mind, um, particularly the New Testament authors building off of, off of the Old Testament. Um, and so if you ever, you know, have a chance to read, read through the dissertation, you'll find um, it's a biblical theology, but um, it's a gradual and increasing synthesis towards systematic theology as you move through the progressive revelation um, and move into the New Testament. Um, so. so that's a little bit about just the genesis of the topic and the methodology um, in, the, in the dissertation. Um, so I figured I'd, I'd just go ahead and uh, overview the topic and kind of just walk through what I did and um, present some of the research and and I'll kind of just walk through it in the in the way that the dissertation develops. So kind of starting at the beginning and just working through chapter by chapter um, and talking about the discoveries there. But maybe I'll, I'll pause before we jump in and just ask if anybody has any questions or anything um, about the the methodology or anything that you that you were uh, were wondering about at this point before we kind of dive in.
I don't know if you're watching the chat also. Um, okay. But I would just say, let's dive in. I mean, I have, okay. I have lots of questions, but I think you're going to hit those. So let's just go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's great. Let's do it. Sounds good. Yeah, no, I, I can't see the chat here. Um, but, uh, but I guess you're keeping track of questions. So, okay. So when we look at the, at the topic, um, you know, you all have read through the argument of the dissertation, I think, um, kind of a summary of it. Um, so I'll kind of walk through and, and kind of dip into the data that I, that I pulled together to, to at least attempt to substantiate my thesis. And, um, evidently my committee felt like I did sufficiently enough to, to graduate me. Um, but the research question here is the theological intersection of sonship and resurrection. Um, and the heart of the thesis is that the image of God is the theological link between the two. Um, you know, very early on as I was studying this topic, I realized that it was actually a three-legged stool. I don't know if you use that analogy in, in your countries, but, you know, a stool has to have three legs in order to stand up. If you only have two, the stool falls over. Um, and these passages that talk about sonship and resurrection also talk about the image of God. Um, so you think about like in Romans 8, uh, we're conformed to the image of Christ, which is the way that God conforms us to his image. Uh, we're conformed to the image of Christ in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So there's the image of God. Uh, you look at, at like Colossians 1, Christ is the image of the invisible God. And then he's said to be the firstborn of all creation. And then a few verses later, he's the firstborn from the dead. So the image of God is there in that passage. Um, you think about like 1 Corinthians 15. And Paul talks there about how we're restored to the image of God by our body being conformed to Christ's resurrection body. We're conformed to the image of the heavenly, he says, um, by resurrection. And so... You know, I, I, as I'm looking at this, I'm realizing it's not just sonship and resurrection that have to do with each other, but the image of God is tied up with it as well. And as I studied it, I found out that the image of God really explains um, the connection between the two. Um, so if we're going to study these two themes of sonship and resurrection, we really should study them individually before trying to understand the connection between the two. And so the first two chapters of the dissertation look, first of all, at resurrection and life and glorification, and then at sonship um, individually. And then the subsequent chapters start to try to understand the connection between the two. So looking first at the idea of, of glorification, I found that when you take the term glory, the dox word family, like doxa, doxadzo, things like that, um, you see that Adam's original glory um, comprised not only his creation in God's image, and that would be his ontology, what's true about him, but it also comprised his function of being God's vice regent and ruling over the earth. And so the glory terminology is applied to both of these, both what he was and what he did, being in the image of God and being God's vice regent um and and as you look at at the passages that ontology of the image of god credentialed adam for the function of dominion and you're probably familiar with that from studying from studying those passages but um you know the image of god is is not a matter some people propose it's a matter of relationship or it's a matter of function um, but when you look at scripture, I argued that the image of God is actually a matter of ontology. It's a matter of what we are, not a matter of relationship or, or a function. Um, it's what qualifies us for the function of dominion, but it doesn't actually include dominion. Dominion is, is a, separate, a separate thing. Um, and so I, I argue for that with several lines of, of evidence. You know, when you look in Genesis 1.26, God created man in his image, and then the, the modal idea there could probably be best translated so that he could have dominion. The image was given, man was made in God's image so that he could have dominion. The image qualified man for dominion. Um, you know, when you look throughout scripture, these terms image and likeness that are used in that passage are always terms that speak of ontology, not terms that speak of function. Um, and, and, you know, when you look throughout the rest of scripture, 
restoration into the image of God is always an ontological transformation. It's never a re-engagement in a function. And so this and several other lines of, of evidence, I conclude that, that the image of God is actually um, a matter of ontology and it's what qualifies us then um, for the function. And so you can kind of, well, I'll, I'll throw out one other point here. The ontology of the image of God is holistic. And what we mean by that is it applies not only to the immaterial part of man, but also to the body. And so to be in the image of God means that something's true about your immaterial part. It's true about your material part. And all of that together qualifies you then for the function of dominion. And so you could summarize it like this. If you look at the idea of what we call glorification or the glory terminology in scripture, there's three parts to it. Our immaterial part was made glorious, Adam's immaterial part. Adam's material part was made glorious. And Adam's dominion was a glorious function. And the way that these relate is the image of God is holistic. It's both immaterial and material. Um, and that qualifies us then for the function of dominion. So dominion is not a part of the image of God. Dominion is a function that the image qualifies us for. And that, that image is holistic. But as you know, the fall marred that image. And so God has purposed to restore the image um, in three events. At the top, let's see if I can do the, the, uh, the laser pointer here. At the top, we've got the immaterial part, and, and that restoration begins with regeneration when we're given the Spirit of God, and then it continues by sanctification, and it culminates when we enter God's presence, and we stand before, before Christ, and we'll be with him and like him because we'll see him as he is. Um, the material part is restored by resurrection. And then following our resurrection, then we're once again restored to dominion over the creation and given, given that function of ruling. Um, and so in these three stages, God is restoring the glory that he created Adam with. Um, and, uh, and the one that we're concerned about is here in the middle, resurrection. So resurrection restores the material part of the image of God to mankind. Um, and, uh, okay. So that, that was chapter two. That's looking at, at the one side, glorification, life, resurrection, that whole topic. What about the other side? What about sonship? Well, the next chapter studied through sonship. Um, and what I argue there is that God created Adam to be, or as his son, that Adam was created with a son father relationship, um, with God. And that, that that relationship, that family father-son relationship was ontologically manifested in Adam bearing the image. Um, you know, what does it mean to have a son? I put up a picture of me and my son. All right. What does it mean to have, to have a son? Well, when you have a son, you originate another being and you give to them your nature. So if an elephant has a child, they give to their child the, the nature of an elephant. When a human being has a son, they give to that, to that son the nature of a human being. Um, and that, that's at the heart of what it, of what it means to, to have a child. And so when God originated Adam as his son, he gave to Adam the communicable attributes of his nature. And that's called the image of God. Um, and so the image of God is the nature that God gives to his sons. God actually imparts part of his nature to us um, when he makes us sons. And he originally gave that image to Adam. And, and, uh, and that was the, the ontological manifestation of the nature of Adam being a son of God. And we know all this because of Genesis 5. You know, you're familiar with Genesis 5. We won't read it for time. But there... Um, God or, or Moses tells us, um, or he, he parallels, I guess I should say, he parallels God's creation of Adam in his image and likeness with Adam's fathering Seth in his image and likeness. And so there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of debate about the image of God. What is the image of God? Um, and a lot of ink's been spilled over it. But Moses puts this in Genesis 5, I think, to help us understand Genesis 1. And God's creation of Adam in his image. He, he wants us to understand it's like a father having a son. 
it's, it's a father imparting to a son his nature. Um, and so the image of God is the nature that God gives to his children um, in the same way that, that a human father would give his, his nature to his children. Um, and so because the image is holistic, the nature that God gives to his children in the image um, includes not only the immaterial part, but also the material part. Our bodies are a part of the nature that God gives to his children and that God originally gave to Adam and that he's restoring us into. Um, and so we could, we could demonstrate it like this. I'll, I'll put this up here. Uh, let me get rid of the laser pointer here, but, um, you know, on the, on the one side, we, we looked at glorification, resurrection, and kind of charted out our understanding of that. But when you look at sonship, the same kind of categories apply. Um, sonship is manifested ontologically in bearing the image of God, and that image is holistic. And so to be a son of God means that we have a nature that's in some way a, a, a sharing in God's nature. God imparted it to us, and so thus we're his image. And it pertains not only to our immaterial, but also to our material part. That there's a sense in which our bodies are a part of the nature um, of, God's, of God's children. Um, and as you know, in the fall, the image was marred. And so scripture speaks of people as having um, lost that sonship relationship to God. We're, we're said to be in need of being made God's sons again. Um, and, and that affected all parts of us, immaterial and material. Um, and so the scripture tells about um, God restoring in two events sonship. When you look at, at what scripture says about God restoring sonship, there's two events. The first is, I'll go back here to the laser pointer. The first is up here on the top level, God imparts um, sonship pertaining to the restoration of our immaterial part by regeneration and the giving of his spirit. Um, and it's called, it's called a birth. We speak about it as the new birth. But in Romans 8, we're told that down here on the bottom level, that the restoration of our body is also an entrance into sonship or a culmination of restoring sonship. Um, and so you can see where we're going, how the resurrection is actually an imparting or a re-imparting of the material part of the image of God, which is the nature of God's son um, that God has. Um, and so God's going to restore sonship in these two events. Regeneration is already taken place um, and resurrection is yet to come. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. This is kind of what we're, what we're discovering um, as far as a framework of these, of these two different sides of the, of the research question, glorification and sonship. And when you kind of line them up, they really, they really have a lot of parallels um, like this. And, and we're concerned with this overlapping part right here, resurrection right there um, in the middle. So what I had to do was explain um, why Paul would use in Romans 8. If he's going to, you know, if, he, if he's thinking about this as an ontological matter of birth and of nature and of um, bearing the nature of God's children, why, and if, if he's talking about a natural sonship of God, a literal sonship of God, why would he use this term that, um, that was used oftentimes in, in that day and age for people who were not naturally a son and who were made a son legally in spite of not bearing the nature of the father and not actually having been literally born into his household. Um, and so when I, when I looked at that term um, and the, the secular usage of it, it, it literally, or it, it was used of, of being made a son by, by a process of adoption but it seems that when Paul brings the term into his theology, he's not, he's not drawing in with it um, a, a cultural practice of adoption. 
in order to teach a theology of adoption as a legal entrance into God's family. Um, and, and I spent a, a while arguing for this in the dissertation, but, but Paul does not really allude to, um, to that kind of cultural event. Um, the only kind of cultural event that he does allude to is, is a coming of age ceremony. Um, and on top of that, when you look at what he does with Huyathesia, he doesn't use it to talk about some kind of legal, forensic, um, almost pretending that someone who's not naturally a son yet is a son. He uses it to talk about being ontologically birthed into a family um, in these passages. Specifically, if you look at, you know, you think about Romans 8 is, is kind of the... Um, Kind of the cornerstone passage for understanding this term and there paul's argument is that the spirit of god gives life and sonship to god's children and because the spirit of god has already given that life to your inner man he'll also do it for your outer man one day as well and thereby make you a son of god um, and so under the huyathasia term, he brings in the idea of being given the spirit and the idea of regeneration. In other words, he brings in this whole first part, regeneration. And then he also turns around and says, and by the way, in verse 23, the material part, the restoration by resurrection, that's also part of huyathasia. And so he's not talking here about a legal adoption. He's talking about ontological change. And he subsumes under the Huyathasia term what we would call regeneration and resurrection. Um, and these are both transformative events. They both restore the image of God. And so this isn't just a matter of, of a legal declaration. This is a matter of ontological transformation into the nature of God's sons. And he subsumes that whole process with this term Huyathasia. And so it's, it seems like he's taking the sweet to see a term and he's using it because it speaks of God making us sons, but he's not just wholesale importing a cultural practice. And if we just study that cultural practice, then we'll figure out how God makes us to be sons. He's using it as a general term for God making us sons and, and tweaking the term and making it fit his purposes. Um, and, and as part of what he, as part of that new meaning that he instills in the term, um, he includes things like regeneration and resurrection. Both of those are the two steps or the two stages of huyathasia. Um, and so huyathasia is used by Paul as, as a comprehensive term for this entire process of being made into the image of God and of being restored to the nature of God's, of God's naturally birthed sons. Um, he's not trying to draw some distinction between a birth model and an adoption model, um, as is so often said. Um, so to kind of recap what we've seen so far, God is making us back into the image of God and making us back into sons in two stages. There's regeneration, which restores the immaterial part and then that, that continues on through sanctification and culminates when we enter into God's presence one day. And then the material part of the image of God is restored by resurrection. And these are the two stages of huyathasia, of being made to be God's sons, of being restored um, to be God's sons. Um, and, and Romans 8 really captures both of those. And we'll, we'll look at Romans 8 more in depth um, a little bit later on. Uh, but this is kind of, you know, as, as I'm studying first the sonship and life aspect and then studying, or I'm sorry, as I'm studying first the resurrection and life side, and then as I'm studying the sonship side, I'm already noticing these connections between the two. Um, and so then in chapter four and the rest of the chapters of the dissertation, I start investigating um, how the two relate and just basically walking through scripture, just starting in Genesis and, and ending up in Revelation and asking, you know, what do these passages teach about the relationship between sonship and resurrection, given the understanding that we've portrayed here on the screen with these, um, with these diagrams. Um, and, and basically, as I walk through the Old Testament in chapter four, um, you know, I'm, I'm 
spend a little bit of time just kind of capturing this idea that the image of God explains the relationship between sonship and and resurrection um, or and and between or between sonship and life um, and we've kind of talked through some of that and it's portrayed there on the screen um, you know the like we said the ontology of sonship um, the nature that the father imparts to the son is the image of God it's both material and immaterial um, but what I bring out in that chapter is that the linchpin of the image of God is the possession of life. You know, you think about it, I'll bring back up the uh, laser pointer here. You've got here the material and the immaterial as a holistic image. What is life? Well, life is the fusion together of the material and the immaterial part and death is rending the image apart um, where the immaterial um, goes to one place and the, the material is put in another. Um, and I, I wanted to take you over and we'll take a look here at, um, let's see here. Yeah. How do I turn off this? There we go. I wanted to take you over to Genesis one and Genesis two. And what I've done here, you know, there's, there's in Genesis one, the, um, the narrative of God making man in his image. And then in Genesis 2, there's again the narrative of God making man. And if you lay those two narratives out side by side, you notice that the elements of, of these two narratives correspond almost exactly. And so here at the top, you've got um, God making the rest of creation besides man. Um, Genesis 1, first 25 verses. Genesis 2, the first six verses. All right. The next element, you've got God creating man. And then you've got God giving two genders as a means to be fruitful and multiply. In Genesis 2, God gives the woman as the means by which Adam would be fruitful and multiply. Immediately following that, you've got a command to rule in Genesis 1. In Genesis 2, it's the placement of man in the garden to rule. And then in Genesis 1, um, everything is given to man. In Genesis 2, everything is given to man except the tree. And so it's like these narratives just, just are walking side by side through each of these elements. And what I want to point out is if you look at the second box there, creation of man in Genesis 1 emphasizes creation of man in God's image. And in Genesis 2, it emphasizes creation of man as a living being. And so it seems like that in these narratives that the possession of life is, is the, the linchpin of being in God's image. And death is the ultimate loss of that image. Um, and this is confirmed then when you get to Genesis 9, we're not supposed to kill people because they're made in God's image um, and they have life in their, in their blood. Um, and so the, the key or the heart of being in God's image is the possession of life from God, specifically from God's spirit. Um, and so when we're thinking about being a son of God, sons of God possess the image of God and have God's life. And you think about it, when you have a son, what do you do? You originate another being and you give to them your life and your nature. And this is what God did with Adam in the beginning. And this is what God is doing with us in restoring us. Um, and so the concept of life is, is tied up there, um, in the in the idea of the image of God, um, another passage that I looked at was um, was Psalm eight. You know, Psalm eight is talking about Adam and his original creation. Um, and when you look at this passage, um, it's a chiastic passage. You'll notice it starts at the top with "O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name," and it ends at the end. Verse 9, O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And so it's about God's glory, and it kind of funnels down to in the middle um, man's role as God's vice regent. Adam's originally created role as God's vice regent. Ruling over creation was the means by which God's glory would fill the earth. We were supposed to rule and represent God um, in the way that we ruled over the earth. And when you look at this, um, 
at this chiasm, it's very neat, except for one line. Look through it. There's one line in the first half of the psalm that doesn't have a corresponding line in the second half. And you'll, you'll notice it's line C, which talks about the mouth of infants and babes. Um, it's talking about the idea of children. Um, and so it seems to suggest that these children in verse 2 are the ones who are doing the ruling. Um, and when you flip over to Hebrews chapter 2, it confirms this understanding. The author picks up on this idea of children of God ruling. And it talks about Christ restoring Adamic rule um, and then bringing many sons to the glory of Adamic rule. And so looking at Psalm 8 confirms what we, what we noticed. Um, I'll go back over to the PowerPoint. It confirms what we noticed earlier that it's sons of God who rule sons of God, in the image of God, rule over God's creation. And this is the heart of what God created Adam as and what he intended mankind to be, that we would be a race of sons who were in his image, ruling over his creation. And, what it, and the nature that God gave to those sons that enables them to reign includes life and the possession of a body. Um, you know, as soon as we die, our reign is cut short. Um, and the fall um, resulted in the loss of, uh, in the marring of this image, the loss of life, the loss of sonship, the loss of dominion. And when you look through scripture, the ultimate expression of the loss of everything that's portrayed on the screen is death. Um, death cuts short our reign. Death rends the image apart. Um, death uh, renders us um, unable to be um, what God created us to be. And so, you know, in Genesis 3, when God comes and curses the earth, um, all of that is spoken of in terms of a loss of dominion. And it's bound up with death as the penalty for sin, because ontologically we're, we're marred, um, and so we are, um, uh, you know, the, the image is marred, sonship is lost, and, and so death comes, and we lose our, um, our ability to reign as God intended. Um, and I'll just run through a couple other points, and then we'll take a break here. But, but basically, the rest of the Old Testament then catalogs Israel, and specifically her kings, as being an attempt to reclaim everything that we've talked about, but a failed attempt. Um, you know, in Genesis 12, Abraham is presented as an attempt to reclaim what Adam lost. And the nation that came from him, Israel, was an attempt to reclaim what Adam lost. Um, you know, Israel's called God's firstborn. The Davidic kings are called God's sons and are called God's firstborn. And so they, they were an attempt um, to reclaim this idea of a race of reigning sons. Um, and the epitome of that attempt was the Davidic kings. You know, in Psalm 89, David's called the firstborn. In Psalm 2-7, when the Davidic king is enthroned, they would say, you are my son of God, this day I have begotten you. Um, and, and so there was this, this attempt to reclaim what Adam lost in Israel. But the Mosaic covenant contained no provision for restoration of the image of God. Um, and so because of that, there was no true reclamation of what Adam lost. Um, the Davidic kings, they would, get a, they would get a wonderful king, a great king, he was a, he was a good king, and then what would happen? He would die. And, and he, would, he would pass off the scene and his reign would be over um, because his material part never was restored into the image of God. He never could quite get back to what Adam was created to be. Um, and so the Old Testament doesn't present a solution. Um, Israel, and especially the Davidic kings, all they could do was nurture a longing for a coming son who would not only be the image of God, but who could restore the image of God to mankind, including the material part. 
And so the Old Testament creates this longing for a son. Um, and so, you know, you think about like, like in, in Isaiah 9, it says unto us, a son is given. It's expecting a day um, when, uh, when a son would be given and he'll sit upon the throne of his father, David, and he'll rule forever. And so you have in this expectation, um, the idea of, of eternal rule, one who doesn't die because he has the image of God uh, restored and he has an undying body that Adam was created with. Um, and, uh, and everything is reset back to Eden and as it should be. And, and that's, all, that's all a part of this messianic expectation of a son who would not only be what Adam lost, but who could bring us to be it as well and restore the race to it. Um, and so in a sense, David's line was an intended temporary failure. Um, you know, they were a type of the success of the Messiah. Um, and so throughout the rest of the dissertation, I moved through New Testament passages that demonstrate um, that Christ succeeded in reclaiming Adam in everything that's up on the screen in the way that, um, that the Davidic kings failed. And ultimately, the ultimate stage of that here in the middle, um, in this material part, he restored the material part of the image of God to humanity by resurrection. Um, and so we'll take a break, but when we come back, um, we'll walk through a couple of these New Testament passages that talk about resurrection being the mechanism by which Christ reclaimed the material part of the Adamic image of God so that by union, we can come to share in it as well. Um, and, and we can be reset back to Eden um, and to Adam. And when you look through these New Testament passages, um, you know, it's just exciting to see what Christ has brought. Um, and uh, it's like the hymn says, more blessings than our father lost. Um, and uh, anyway, I guess at this point, we'll take a little break and come back in a moment, is that the idea, Dr. Arnold? Great, good. Um, this goes way back, but you put up a chart earlier, the three positions, and one of them was John MacArthur's view. He later repudiated or retracted that, right? Yes, yeah, he did. And that was one of the things that really comforted me as I went through this dissertation is, you know, like what would move a man like John MacArthur to say the things that he said? Well, he's seeing something in Scripture. Now, he fitted into his theology in, 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 I think, the wrong place. But but the fact that he would propose the kinds of things that he proposed was very comforting to me because, obviously, you know, there's something going on here. He just he didn't quite explain it properly, um, but he is picking up on something that is legitimately there in Scripture. John MacArthur doesn't just go off and state wild, random things. You know, he's, he's obviously seeing something there. Um, but, yes, he did retract it. Um, and if you pick up his systematic theology, he retracts that he did as well in a journal article um, in the, I think it's the Journal for Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. Um, and, and so, yes, yeah, he went, he went back on that and basically went back to the, the first position on the left. It's interesting. Yeah. Cause I mean, it sort of does give you the impression, that, okay, there's some kind of stray piece or some kind of data. Yeah. That he's feeling right. like he's not getting a satisfying explanation for, and he was, mm -hmm. he was originally chasing that. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, let's take our break then. And then I've got right on the hour. So let's just come back at five minutes after the hour and we'll, we'll pick up there. Okay. Okay. Thanks. See you all in a bit. Okay. Well, I, I feel kind of bad for you all because you probably feel like you're drinking out of a fire hydrant. I don't know if that's an expression <laughs> that you use in your country, but here we would say you're drinking out of a fire hydrant, meaning that there's a lot of information coming at you and it's a lot to process. Um, you all are very patient. I, I appreciate that. Um, and uh, so we've, we basically looked at um, kind of the framework of, of the thesis. Um, and it's, it's visually represented there on the screen. Um, basically that resurrection restores the material part of the image of God which is a part of the nature of God's, of God's sons. Um, and so then the rest of the dissertation just kind of goes through um, passages in the New Testament. Um, and it, it basically shows that this kind of 
theological framework from the Old Testament is what these authors are assuming, particularly Paul, um, but also John and Luke um, and, uh, and, and even, even in Paul's preaching, you know, they're assuming this framework. And when you, when you sort of think in terms of this framework and you read these New Testament passages, you can see that under the surface of what Paul is saying, he's thinking in these terms um, and thinking, thinking in this framework. Um, so we'll take a look at a couple of those passages. Um, I picked out two that, that we'll spend some time in. Um, and I think they're probably um, some of the most uh, some of the most helpful. Um, we'll look at Acts 13 for a little while, and then we'll look at Romans 8. Um, we'll comment briefly on 1 Corinthians 15. Um, and I don't really have a lot of visuals for these. Um, so I, what I thought is it would probably be helpful if you just have your scriptures open in front of you, and we'll just kind of walk through the passages and make some observations and look through them and try to try to understand in these New Testament passages, how resurrection and sonship connect with each other and how the image of God is the link between these two concepts um, and what part Christ plays in all of that. Um, so we'll start with, with Acts 13, if you want to open up there to Acts 13. Um, and, uh, if you, if you look at Acts 13, the, the chapter is all about the Jews rejecting Jesus. And so in the latter part of the chapter, after this sermon, um, you know, Paul makes this famous statement that he's going to turn from the Jews to the Gentiles because the Jews have rejected what he's had to say. And this sermon is against that backdrop of Jewish rejection of their Messiah. And Paul's main indictment of the Jews is that they rejected their Messiah despite his fulfilling messianic prophecy. Um, and so Paul comes to them and he says, look, look, you're, Jesus fulfilled all of these prophecies and you still rejected him. What's wrong with you guys? And so I don't know if you can, you can still see my screen. This is my, my little display of Acts 13 and I highlighted in yellow the messianic prophecies. And you can see that they're all the way through the sermon. And the main, um, the main prophecy that Paul brings up is prophecy of resurrection. And he comes to them and he says, look, the Old Testament foretold a resurrection and Christ was resurrected. Obviously, he's your Messiah. So why don't you accept him? Um, and among other passages that he looks to in the Old Testament to to demonstrate prediction of a resurrection, he points to Psalm 2-7. Um, and he quotes that in verse, in verse 33 of, of Acts 13. Um, and Psalm 2-7 says, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten you. And Paul says that was fulfilled um, at the resurrection there. Now, I've had people say to me that because this word begotten, the Greek word genao, because the word is um, uh, is a metaphor, or, or because because begetting has to do with imparting of life, that Paul used this word begotten as simply a metaphor for the giving of life. That Paul wasn't talking about actual entrance into sonship; he was just using begetting as a metaphor for God giving life by resurrection. But when you look at the at the statement in Psalm two seven and here in in Acts 13, um, there's this other little phrase there, you are my son, all right? And that speaks of, of a status of being a son of God. Um, and that status of sonship is imparted by begetting. And when you go back and look at the Hebrew in the Old Testament, um, there's an emphatic pronoun there. It, it reads, I myself have begotten you. And so God is claiming, he's, the emphasis of the statement is, is on his being the one who did the begetting. I'm the one who did the begetting. I myself did the begetting. And then on the, on the word son, there's a first person pronominal ending, my son. And so the conjunction of these two grammatical 
features there demonstrates that the begetting is what produced the sonship. God is coming and saying, look, I'm the one who did the beginning. And so the son that was produced is my son. And that emphasis upon God's role brings the two together and shows that the beginning is what produced the sonship. Um, and the, the Greek translation picks up on that with an emphatic ego um, in there as well. And so we have this term begetting, and it seems that the passage is, is literally saying that he was begotten by resurrection and that, and that begetting produced sonship. Um, and, and that, that term begotten speaks of, of entrance into natural sonship, having the nature of the father, um, not merely legal declaration. God didn't come and, and legally adopt a son. He actually begot a son, um, in, in a very natural and in a very birth sense. So what do we do with that? How could someone who was the son of God from all eternity be begotten by resurrection? In what sense was he begotten and did he enter into sonship? Well, when you look at Acts 13, this quotation of Psalm 2-7 is really just one instance of a major theme that runs all the way through the sermon, all the way from the beginning to the end. And that theme is Israel's need for leadership. So if you look up at, um, at verse 17, he talks about God chose our fathers and exalted them when they were in the land of Egypt. Then he brings them out of Egypt. <clears throat> and for 40 years in verse 18, they wander. And then in verse 19, when he had destroyed the nations, he brought them into the land of Canaan. And then verse 20, after that, he gave them judges. So that's a form of leadership in Israel. Um, and they had judges for about 450 years. Then Samuel the prophet came. So there's another type of leadership of a prophet. Um, afterwards, they desired a king. So there's a third kind of leadership. And so God gave them Saul. And it's ultimately out of all of this failure of the prophet, the judges, the king, it's out of their failure to lead Israel adequately that then in verse 22, God raised up unto them David to be their king. And so David and his line is presented as God's gift to this nation um, to be their leader. And, and then it says um, in verse 23, of this man's seed, God hath raised up um, unto Israel a savior, Jesus. And so from David's line then came the ultimate leader, the ultimate savior, um, which, uh, which was the Messiah. <clears throat> and the Psalm 2-7 quotation is a meditation back on the Davidic covenant, which is the heart of God's relationship with this Davidic line. Um, and when you look at back at that Davidic covenant, there's sonship language in it. It says there, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me um, in 2 Samuel 7, 14. And so there's an expectation of one coming from David's line um, as part of the Davidic covenant, who would be a son of God, and he would be a ruler. And so Psalm 2-7, when it talks about my son and begetting, it's, it is meditating on that, on that sonship aspect of the Davidic covenant and the expectation of a son to come. Um, and so the emphasis here is on a son of God from David's line, who would be the ruler that Israel longed for. Um, and this is what Paul is presenting Jesus as being. He's the one who fulfilled that messianic expectation. Um, and so what Paul does is he weaves into the sermon um, different corollaries of this main idea. Right? The main idea is that there's going to be a son from David's line who will rule um, and who will be the leader that Israel needs. But as a corollary of of this royal descent from David, there's certain things that will be true about the Messiah. And he brings three of those into, into the sermon. The obvious first is the right to rule. A king gets to rule. Um, and so like we pointed out throughout the passage, there's an emphasis upon leadership and ruling. 
um, the judges are mentioned, the prophets are mentioned, even King Saul. And it's when all these people failed to rule properly that God appointed David. Um, and then from David's line, God raised up Jesus to be the ultimate son of David. And so it's in this vein of rule over God's people that Paul brings in the Psalm 2-7 quotation. Um, it deals with ruling over God's people as a part of being the ultimate descendant of David. Um, a second aspect of being this expected son of God is not just that he would be a ruler over God's people, but that he would be a son. Um, you know, in Psalm 2-7, he makes this statement, you are my son, this day I've begotten you. And that was quoted of the Davidic kings at their enthronement. In Psalm 89, 27, David's called the firstborn. We talked about the language in the Davidic covenant that, that David's descendant, I'll be a father to him and he'll be a son to me. Um, in First Chronicles, you see the same thing happening. Um, and so when Paul quotes Psalm 2, 7, about this Davidic son, he's not just bringing in the idea of rule, but he's also bringing in the idea of a son who rules um, as part of that expectation of the Davidic, of the Davidic descendants. Um, and you see this, like, for example, in Isaiah 9 that we mentioned before, where you have the expectation unto us a son is given, and God will give unto him the throne of his father David, and he'll rule forever and ever. So the, the expected ruler was going to be a son of God. Um, the same kind of thing happens then when the angel speaks in Luke 1, and he, he alludes back to Isaiah 9 and talks about the throne of his father David being given unto the son of the Most High. Um, there's this expectation of a son who would come from David's line who would rule. Um, in Hebrews 1, again, Psalm 27 is quoted. 2 Samuel 7 is quoted. And he speaks there about a son of God with eternal rule um, as a corollary of descent from David. And so the same kind of thing happens again in Hebrews 1. So basically what we're saying is Paul is talking here to these Israelite people and he's saying to them, Jesus um, has come as the descendant of David. And, and what that means is in the first place, he's going to rule. But in the second place, he's going to be a son. But in the third place, He's going to have what, what's called the sure mercies of David in, in verse 34. And that's a quotation from Isaiah 55. Um, and when he quotes the sure mercies of David, he's talking about um, the resurrection. In fact, if you just look at verse 32, um, he says there, We declare unto you glad tidings how the promise which was made unto the fathers God hath fulfilled the same under his, under his children in that he raised up Jesus. So he's going to talk about resurrection. And then he makes three quotations, one from Psalm 2-7 at the end of verse 32, one from Isaiah 55 in verse 34, and then one from Psalm 16 in verse 35. And in all of those, he's talking about resurrection. And so he's bringing together this idea of, of a Davidic, son who will rule and he'll rule forever because he'll have resurrection life. Um, and he's bringing together these, these themes as part of the Davidic, the Davidic expectation. And he considers all of that to be a part of, in verse 32, the promises made to the father. It was all expected in the old Testament. Um, and so the Davidic Messiah's role as God's reigning son um, was going to come by resurrection because the life that it imparted enabled him to reign forever. And so it's, it's in this kind of thinking that Paul quotes Psalm 2-7 and says that the son was begotten at the resurrection. Um, it's all a corollary of his being a royal descendant of David and um, reclaiming um, or, or succeeding where the Davidic kings failed. But the question is, why is royal sonship, eternal rule, why is all of that a corollary of descent from David? And the answer is what we saw that David was an attempt and David's line was an attempt to reclaim what Adam was created to be and what Adam lost. And so you have this progression in scripture of Adam being the original, 
Israel and David's line being an attempt to reclaim and a failed attempt because there was no restoration of the image of God. And then Christ succeeding where David and his line failed in reclaiming Adam um, in that way. And subsequent study in Romans 1 specifically connects um, David and the expectation of a Messiah uh, from David's line with sonship and life by resurrection. Same thing happens in Romans 8, which we'll get to in a second. Um, in 1 Corinthians 15, it's all presented as a reclaiming of Adam and of the image that Adam was created with. Um, in Colossians 1, he speaks of, of Christ being the image of the material of the immaterial God, the firstborn of all creation, um, which is the place that Adam vacated when he fell. And so all of it is, is, is portrayed not just as succeeding where David failed, but as actually all the way back to Adam, reclaiming Adam and what Adam lost. Um, <clears throat> so you can see that this is what's going on here um, in Paul's mind in in Acts 13. But when you look at Acts 13, Paul doesn't just talk about Christ reclaiming Adam in order to keep it all for himself, in order to hoard these blessings to himself. All the way through, there's invitations um, to come to Christ for salvation. He's the Savior of Israel. He brings a word of salvation in verse 25. We dare not reject it at the end of the, of the sermon. Um, in verse 34, the you, um, I will give to you the sure mercies of David is actually plural. And so we see already that not only did Christ reclaim certain things by resurrection, but he did it that we might come to share in it. He didn't just do it all for himself. He did it in a prototypical sense. Um, he came to share in it that we might one day share in it as well. Um, by means of union with him. Um, and so you see here in, in, First Prince, or in, in Acts 13, um, these ideas of reclaiming by resurrection, sonship and life and Davidic rule, which was an attempt to reclaim Adamic rule and Adamic life and Adamic sonship. Um, and it all came by resurrection and Christ did it in order that... Um, in order that we might come to share in it as well. And that prototypical idea is just hinted at here in Acts 13, but it's very explicit um, in, in other passages. And so then I spent the rest of the dissertation in those other passages, in Romans 1, 3 through 4, where we're told that one from David's line was declared to be the son of God with power by resurrection from the dead. And so you can see this idea of, of David's lineage and the spirit of God coming together in synergy to produce um, the perfect candidate to reclaim everything that Adam lost. Um, we'll look at Romans 8 a little bit. In 1 Corinthians 15, you've got the same thing. In Hebrews 1 through 7, um, there's a, this idea of a son who reclaims the image of God and life and therefore reclaims Adamic dominion. Um, it's the theme that flows through the the hymn in Colossians 1, um, the same thing happens in Revelation 1 through 3. Um, in the angel's announcement to Mary in Luke 1, um, you start seeing this, these connections between sonship and Davidic descent um, and reclaiming Adam and the image of God and, and these themes all coming together in, again and again in, in these passages. Um, and when you look at them, you see restoration of life and the body as the material part of the image of God. Um, and that's all considered to be a restoration of sonship. And you see that, that that restoration that we expect happened first to Christ so that he would be the prototype of our restoration um, throughout, those, throughout those passages. So that's Acts 13. In a lot of ways, Acts 13 kind of hints at these things. Um, that you see more explicitly in Romans 8 and other passages. Um, and so we'll take our, the rest of our time here now. We have probably about 15 more minutes, and we'll just kind of look through Romans 8 and what goes on there um, and, and some of these themes in Romans 8 and the way that, that they're put together there. Um, 
and, uh, and, and Paul's thinking. Let me ask you this. When you think about Romans 8, what person of the Trinity comes to mind immediately? Um, well, I think you'd probably answer the Spirit of God. And you're, you're right. The Spirit is, is the key person in Romans 8. He's mentioned 19 times in the chapter and only four times previous to that in the first seven chapters of Romans. And so Romans 8 focuses on the spirit of God. And Paul in Romans 8 is writing to people who are in physical bodily trials. They're suffering in their body. Um, and that theme runs all the way through the chapter. And the hope that Paul writes to those people with is found in verse 11. You look at Romans 8 and verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life also to your mortal bodies. And so Paul writes to these people who are suffering in their body. And the hope that he gives them is that the spirit of God will one day raise and, and fix and transform that body. And so it's a passage about resurrection by the Spirit of God is the theme of the chapter and the Spirit working that, that resurrection in us. So the first part of Romans 8, the first 13 verses, develops a contrast between life in the flesh and life in the Spirit. Right? Life in the flesh, because it leads to sin and condemnation under God's law, life in the flesh leads to death. And on the other hand, life in the spirit leads to life. Living in the flesh will earn our death. Living in the spirit um, brings, brings life. And Paul paints this, this contrast between the flesh and death and the spirit and life. Um, but in verse 10, there's an obvious exception to that rule. If you look at the first part of verse 10, he says, if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin. And what he means by dead is mortal. So he's writing to these people and he's saying, look, if you live according to the flesh, it earns death. If you live according to the spirit, it brings life. And these people are saying, well, hold on a second. I'm in the spirit, but I'm still in a, in a dying body. That doesn't seem to fit. I thought that if I was in the spirit, I would have life. And I'm in the spirit, but I have a this dying body and I'm suffering in this dying body. And Paul answers that in the next couple verses with, uh, if you look at the end of verse 10, he says that even though the body is, is mortal or dead because of sin, yet the spirit, and that's the immaterial inner part of man, the spirit is alive because of righteousness. So even though your body is dying and you have a mortal body, he says, look at, look at the immaterial part of you. Look at your spirit, your human spirit. It's actually alive because of righteousness. And then he goes on in verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and he's the one who's bringing that life to your immaterial part, then he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. In other words, the heart of his argument is that present life in the inner man guarantees future life for the outer man. And the reason that having present life in the inner man guarantees future life in the outer man is because the spirit is the one who gives both. And so he's saying to them, look, if, if the spirit of God brought life to your inner man, and by the way, if he brought life to Jesus in his outer man, then he's going to bring life to your outer man as well. And so Paul gives the conclusion of this flesh spirit contrast in verse 13. He says, if you, if you are living according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the spirit, you're putting to death, the deeds of the body, you'll live. And I spend a while in the dissertation demonstrating that he's not saying that we earn our salvation. Um, but he is completing a syllogism there and, and concluding this contrast that the flesh brings death and the spirit brings life. And, and if you're concerned about the fact that your body is currently dying 
even though you're in the spirit, look at what the spirit's done for your inner man. He gave you life in your inner man. And that's a guarantee that he's going to do it for your outer man as well one day. And that's the heart of the hope that Paul brings um, to these people in their, in their suffering. Then in verse 14, he mixes it up a little bit. Look at the first word of verse 14. Four. So he gave, he gave that, that conclusion statement in verse 13 that the spirit brings life, the flesh brings death. Now, the reason why he can say that in verse 14 is because everybody who's led by the spirit of God is a son of God. And so you can see his line of reasoning there. Those in the spirit have life because those in the spirit are sons. Uh, and it shows that Paul considered life to be a corollary of sonship. So he's basically saying the spirit of God will give life because the spirit of God makes you a son of God and sons have life. And so he regards life to be something that's true of the sons of God. And so it, you know, it seems really abrupt to introduce sonship at this point. Like this is the first time in Romans that he's mentioned the sonship of the believer. And he just kind of throws it in. Almost like he's assuming that the reader understands that there's this inherent connection between sonship and life, that sons of God live. And, and he can assume that because of everything that we saw in the Old Testament. Um, and this, this expectation um, throughout the Old Testament of, of a son coming who will bring life. And the fact that Adam was created as a son with life um, and in the image of God. Um, and so then as we look over the next 10 verses or so at what Paul says about life in the spirit, you can see that he's building on this connection between life and sonship in the Old Testament, and specifically the connection between life and sonship in Adam. You know, throughout the rest of the chapter, he talks about the curse, and he talks about what the spirit brings as being an undoing of the curse. Um, and so it's a resetting back to Eden. It's a resetting back to Adam. Um, you know, he talks there as well about the components of Adamic glory that we noted previously. There's life. There's the image of God. There's sonship. There's dominion. All these things are in Romans 8 um, as a part of resetting back to Adam. And so what we're going to do is just trace through some of these aspects of resetting back to, to Adam and resetting back to Eden. Um, and so we'll look at, at life by resurrection. We'll look at sonship. Um, we'll look at the image of God and we'll look at dominion. These are all parts of what we put up on the screen before in that diagram. These are all parts of what it means to be a son of God as Adam was created to be. And Paul is talking in Romans eight about the spirit of God, restoring all that back to us by means of resurrection. Um, and so the first part of Adamic glory in the chapter, the obvious one, is resurrection, life. You know, you read through Romans 8, and it's all about resurrection. It's all about life. Um, and again, he's arguing that because we have life in our inner man, we'll have life one day in our outer man by resurrection. Um, and so he, he brings up as the first aspect of what the Spirit of God restores, he brings up life by resurrection. Um, but it's not just life, it's the life of sons of God, as we've been discovering. And so we saw this in verse 14, um, that with that, that word for, he's introducing sonship as the status of which life is a corollary. Those who are sons of God are those who live, and the Spirit of God is the one who brings all of that. And so Paul speaks in verses 15 to 17 of our present state of sonship, that we currently are sons of God. He says that we have received the spirit of Weathesia. We already have it there. Um, he says we currently can cry, Abba, Father. Um, he says that the spirit testifies that we're presently children of God. In verse 16, he's talking about our current experience of sonship, that we currently are sons of God. And just like with life, Paul introduces this current sonship because it's the guarantee of future sonship. In verses 
17 and 18 and 19, his argument basically is you're a son of God and sons of God inherit glory, which is future sonship. And so he's making this argument that your present sonship is what guarantees your future sonship, just like he made the argument that your present life guarantees your future life. And he can make that argument because of the role of the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit who gives present life and future life. It's the Spirit who gives present sonship and future sonship. And so in Paul's mind, life and sonship are two sides of the coin of life in the Spirit. If you're in the Spirit, and if you have the Spirit, the Spirit of God has worked life and sonship in you now, and that's the guarantee that the Spirit will also work for you life and sonship in the future. And this is at the heart of the argument that he's making with these people. They're suffering in their bodies. And he says, look inside of you. What has God's Spirit done for your inner man? He's given you life, and he's given you a heart of sonship. And because God's Spirit gave you that current experience of life and sonship, then it's a guarantee that one day he'll give you the future experience of it as well. Um, <clears throat> and so there are two stages of life in the Spirit. And the first stage is brought about by regeneration. The second stage is brought about by resurrection. And this is what, we're, what we found um, in the Old Testament here. So if we go over to... You know, we're looking at the, at the PowerPoint here. Regeneration restores the immaterial part to us and immaterially makes us have life and sonship. Resurrection restores the material part, which is the second or the, the completing stage of restoring sonship, the culmination of it. And Paul's saying it's all by the Spirit of God. He's the one who brings it. And the fact that he did the first part is the guarantee that he's going to do the second part. Um, and so it's for that reason that Paul can say in verse 23 that the Spirit is the first fruits of the resurrection. The Spirit, we already have an advanced experience of the Spirit pertaining to our inner man, and that guarantees the Spirit's work one day pertaining to our outer man as well. And this is the comfort that Paul brings to these people um, in, in this suffering. Um, and so Paul can go so far in verse 23 as to say that the redemption of our body is the future impartation of sonship. It's the future aspect of huiasasia. And he essentially equates the two because the spirit restoring our body is restoring the material part of what it means to be a son of God, um, as Adam was originally created to be. Um, and so then in verses 29 through 30, Paul concludes um, that filial status in God's family and glorification by resurrection are two different ways of describing the same goal of predestination. If you look at verse 29, God predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. There's the image of God. So that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. In other words, being made in the image of God gives us sonship status, brother status with Christ, and that's all what God predestined us to. In verse 30, God predestined us to calling and to, justi to justification and to glorification. So Paul predestined, or God predestined us in verse 29 to sonship status by conformity to the image of Christ. And Paul says in verse 30 that God predestined us to glorification, which throughout Romans 8 has been resurrection. And so he's bringing all these themes together and saying that resurrection will conform us to the image of Christ and thereby make us sons. And so the image of God concept comes in as well. And then the idea of, of Adamic dominion is there in the chapter as well. Um, you know, we found that creation in God's image enabled us to rule. It was the qualification for dominion. And so Paul speaks of, of reclaiming Adamic rule in verses 19 through 22 and undoing the curse of Genesis 3. Um, Paul says that the current state of creation is one of slavery. 
Um, he says that, that it's subjected to slavery, but one day it's going to be set free into the freedom and glory of the children of God. And so there's an expectation in creation, not only of its restoration, but of our restoration by resurrection to make us once again, children of God um, with the image of God and ready to rule over it as we were intended to be um, in the beginning. Um, and so he, he brings all this together um, in this chapter. So Paul speaks of resurrection's restoration of sons that possess this holistic image of God and subsequently reigning over creation. And he presents the whole thing as an undoing of the curse of Genesis 3. And so he presents the whole thing as a resetting back to the ideal of Genesis 1 through 2. And verses 17 to 18 speak of that as Adamic glory, the concept that we, that we began with. Um, and so it's fundamentally sonship that's required to reset all that. Sonship is the status from which everything else flows. Because we're sons of God, we'll be in the image of God. Because we're sons of God, we'll have life. Because we're sons of God, we'll be able to reign. And so it's because sonship is, is at the heart of what God is restoring, Paul speaks throughout the chapter of, of the groaning of birth pangs. If you look in verse 22, creation is groaning. And the word there is, is the groaning of a woman in labor. And in verse 23, we also are groaning. But the most beautiful thing is in verse 26, the spirit of God is groaning. He's groaning in labor pains, wanting to birth us into, into sonship by resurrection. You know, and so when we're suffering and we're groaning and, and thinking like, oh my, I just, I, I can't wait for that future day of resurrection when God is going to fix my body. Paul's message for us in verses 26 to 27 is that the spirit of God is groaning right along with us. He's the agent of all that transformation. And he's groaning like a mother wanting to give birth to her child. And, and he's groaning um, in, in that expectation. So this is the transformation that Paul's talking about here. Um, well, what role does Christ play in all of that? Um, you know, throughout the chapter, Christ is, is a part of what Paul is saying. Um, and I think when you trace it all the way through Romans 8, you'll realize um, and notice that our restoration is dependent upon not just the Spirit of God, but also upon Christ and the role that Christ takes in that is that he's the organic prototype of the restoration. Um, you know, in, in 1 Corinthians 15, we see Paul bringing out this concept that when we are resurrected, um, our body is conformed to Christ's body, and that completes restoration of the image of the heavenly, he says. And so it seems that in Christ's humanity, he, by resurrection, reclaimed the material part of the human image of God. And then by conformity, we're, we're made like that, and we come to share in his sonship. Um, and so by resurrection, Christ, um, Christ became the organic prototype of our sonship, of our life, of our being the image of God, uh, of our dominion, of all of these aspects of Adamic glory. And so Paul reasons, um, so I'm going to skip over a couple of these things here, but Paul says in, in verse 17 that we come to share in Adamic glory by coming to share in the glory with Christ. And he even uses the word co-inheritors. So if God is restoring us to be sons so that we can inherit all the aspects of Adamic glory, life and dominion and the image of God. And if that happens by becoming co-inheritors with Christ, then it would seem that we come to share in Christ's sonship and that we come to participate in the benefits of that sonship by, by union with him. And so in other words, it's not just that Christ's Adamic sonship is prototypical of ours, 
and we come to share in it. But Christ's entrance into that sonship by resurrection was prototypical of our entrance into that sonship by resurrection. Um, and so his resurrection was his begetting into Adamic sonship pertaining to, to his immaterial part. And Paul confirms this understanding in verses 29 through 30, where he talks about the, the mechanism for our coming to be a brother of Christ and the mechanism of our being glorified is conformity to the image of his son. And so we come to be conformed to Christ materially um, by resurrection, um, which is the glorification in Romans 30 or in verse 30. And, and all of that results in our filial sonship status and we're, we end up as Christ's brothers. And I'm kind of like really going quickly over, over some of these connections in the passage. If you, I encourage you to get the dissertation, read it if you're at all curious about, about more. But at the heart of that, Paul says, all this happened so that Christ would be the firstborn among many brethren. And so it seems like that he's saying that Christ's resurrection was his begetting, like he spoke of in Acts 13, into this Adamic sonship and reclaiming the holistic image of God as his material part was restored, the material part of his human nature. And that was his birth. And he was the first to be born into the family in that sense. And then we come to be conformed to him and we're born in, into the family, um, culminating in our resurrection. And our material part is conformed to his material part. And this restores the image of God in us. Um, and so you can see that Christ is, is regarded to be, um, to be the organic prototype of this whole restoration process for us. So when you beget a child, you impart to them your life and your nature. God did that for Adam. And that nature was the image of God. And when God begets us one day by resurrection, um, our nature as sons of God, the image of God will be restored completely at that point. And that all happened to Christ um, pertaining to his human nature. Um, so I can, um, let's see, I'm going to slide back over here to the, to the PowerPoint here. And, and I'll just summarize kind of the argument of the dissertation. This is the last part that I had here. Um, but to kind of sum it all up, um, what we've got here is um, we've got basically the idea that the image of God is the nature that God gives to his sons. And that was true of Adam in the beginning. And then Adam lost it. And God's restoring it. A father gives his nature to his children and God gave the communicable attributes of his nature to Adam. That was called the image of God. And so because the image of God is holistic the body is a part of that filial nature to be a son of God means that we, that we have a certain nature as God's sons. And that includes our body. And the linchpin of the image of God is the possession of life, the union of the two parts of the image of God, the material and the immaterial um, as animated by the spirit of God, which God did for Adam in the beginning. And God is, is in the process of doing for us and it'll culminate in our material part at resurrection. And so restoring the filial nature is a two-stage process. They're the two stages of life in the spirit. Regeneration, sanctification, and glorification restores the immaterial part of man. And resurrection restores the material part. And these are the two sides of, of the nature of God's children, of the image of God. And so because he was fully human, Christ's human nature included the material part of the image of God, which was restored to human filial nature by resurrection as a prototype for our restoration. And it's that that Paul's capturing when he says he was the firstborn from the dead so that he would be among many brethren. Um, and it's that that he's capturing, I think, in, in Acts 13, when he says that Christ was begotten from the dead and fulfilled that expectation um, created by the Davidic dynasty. And so we can, I concluded the dissertation with this hymn of praise, thine be the glory, risen, conquering son, 
endless is the victory thou or death hast won. And I think this is the posture that God would have us to conclude with of, of worship towards Christ for coming and for um, reclaiming everything that Adam lost. You know, and none of what I'm saying argues against his being the son of God from all eternity. All that pertains to his divine nature. Everything that we're talking about pertains to his human nature. And as the last Adam reclaiming what it means to be truly human as Adam was created to be. And then we come to participate in that um, by union with him. So. so that's what I spent four years of my life on. Okay, um, great. All right, so I'll pop through some different, different questions. Um, mm -hmm. And as you guys have questions, I'm gonna I'm gonna put up some different questions that were asked here, and then I'll ask some of my questions also. Uh, here's from Pastor Jun Gonzalez. He's asking, is it a valid corollary to say that the resurrection uh, rested or wrestled took away the uh, the Adamic dominion from Satan, the god of this world? Would our filial relationship with Jesus make us also quotation mark gods in the sense of John 10 34 Psalm 82 6 mm -hmm. what do you think yeah I I think there's a very real sense in which what happened at at the fall um uh in in some sense changed our filial status over from being that of the son of God to being a son of the devil in the sense that, and I think this is what Jesus is getting at in John 8, when he says, um, you are of your father, the devil. And then he says, the devil was a liar from the beginning. His nature is to lie, and you all lie. And that shows that you're of, of your father, the devil. And so we're called, like in Ephesians 2, sons of, of wrath. Um, and, uh, you know, there is a very real sense in which the devil rules over this world. And as fallen human beings, we act as his agents of dominion rather than that of God. And so, yes, I think all of that is tied up in the curse. Um, and, and God does undo all of that. And so there, there is a sense in which Jesus says, yes, w the father or the devil is our father, not in the sense that he originated us, but in the sense that we bear his nature um, and, and the image of God that wants um, completely reflected God as perfectly as a human being could now reflects elements of the devil's nature instead. Um, so. It's interesting because it relates to a question I had written down at the, at the beginning, you were drawing some um, parallels between image of God and sonship. This, am I right? This would be a place where they're not analogous exactly where, okay. So I, I still, as an unbeliever, I still retain something of the image of God, right? But um, in this framework, in terms of sonship, it's, if I'm understanding the framework, completely lost. Like, I'm not a son mm -hmm. of God at all. So we've got yeah. some dis, discontinuity, or they're, they're not analogous in that respect. Fair enough? Or mm -hmm. how would you process yeah. that? Yeah, and I actually put in a, a footnote in the dissertation where I kind of wrestled with this. And what I came down to in the end is I just, I want to use the scriptural terminology and the scriptural picture, which would be that the image of God um, is still born and needs repair. And so the term that I would use is marred. But when it comes to sonship, um, it's, it's spoken of as not possessed in any sense. So a lost man cannot call God his father. He stands in need of sonship. And so the way that I, the way that I kind of systematic theologically stated it is that there's evidently a minimum of of bearing the nature of God that can still be regarded as sonship of God and man sunk below that minimum. Um, and so, so the scriptures can speak of us still bearing the image of God, but it's marred to the extent that we're no longer considered to be his children. Um, and so scripture speaks of a need of complete of, of restoration. Yeah, that's kind of where I landed okay. on it. So. Um, how about this? There were a couple of questions. I'm sorry, I'm just kind of I'm hitting you with questions fast, but we have a yeah, lot of them. Okay. Um, okay, so on the question of adoption, I liked I liked what you did there, just because then we're not doing you know all of our lexical 
uh, work is not like cultural mirror reading, which, you know, this, mm -hmm. I mean, when you get into the adoption thing, then it's all like, are we going back to Jewish roots? We're we going to Greek roots. I mean, we just get yeah. lost in there. We don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so it gets messy and I don't like doing my theology off of guesswork from culture and backgrounds. Um, yeah. So the, the argument you made there, I like that. Uh, the cell that we have to see at is moving into new lexical terrain. I found a little bit challenging. Um, and did I get your argument right? It's almost like Paul is using the word in a way that doesn't fit previous usage. Or is there is there any Old Testament LXX kind of precedence or anything you can do there as far as bolstering that that lexical understanding? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I mean, I didn't think the term actually occurs in the, in the OT. Um, and so, so basically, you know, what I was left with was looking at, at the NT and, and you're right that when you read any, you know, a lot of previous attempts to, um, to explain this term, it degenerates into a search for the cultural practice that then um, based on that cultural practice, we figure out Paul's theology. And I, th I think it's just very dangerous to do that. And when you look at the passages, it's not what Paul's doing. Um, you know, if he was doing that, he certainly should have explained a lot more clearly this theology of adoption rather than just throwing out a term. And the only way that we could figure out what that theology of adoption is, is by going to secular culture. Um, you know, he, he's not, he's not doing that. He's, he's, I, Garner uses the word filching. He's filching a term um, and then, and then in the passage, he assigns to it, um, both what we would call regeneration and, and resurrection. Um, so I, I basically was left with scriptural usage, um, to, to substantiate that, um, because the term is, is used and, and Scott did a lot of work on this in the 1980s. The term is used in secular culture for the practice of making a son, um, and, and so there, there's not really a parallel outside of the New Testament of what Paul's doing with it. So you're kind of left with arguing from the passages themselves. Yeah. Which if I wanted to make that argument, then I would do something like, well, you know, um, Paul is going after ideas that he doesn't, he doesn't exactly have like technical terms to pull in the language to work with. Mm -hmm. So he uses the words yeah. he has or something. Yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah. Brother Gerard was asking, does Paul's use of adoption have any legal connotation? Um, and it's sort of related to what I was just asking. Could he have used another word instead of adoption if he didn't intend the legal connotation? So, I mean, that, mm -hmm. it is an interesting, it's very yeah. interesting argument for Brother Gerard kind of kind of kicking back a little bit. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there is definitely the idea of rights of sonship there. Um, and so I'm not saying that there isn't a legal flavor to the word. You know, he, he talks about inheritance. And in Galatians 4, he talks about inheritance because we're sons of God by Huyathesia. Um, but what I'm saying is that that inheritance and the rights of sonship don't come by a legal process in spite of lack of natural relationship. When you look at the New Testament, um, it's natural and really all the way back to what God did with Adam. It's natural relationship bearing the nature of God. And Paul takes and captures all that by Huyathesia. So yes, rights of sonship and legal status are imparted, but they're not imparted in spite of birth. They're imparted through birth by God's spirit and, and giving life and nature. So, so it's, a, um, it's an addition, not, a, not an either or. It's a both and. Good. Okay. How about this? How would you summarize our sonship at present? post-adoption, pre-resurrection. Um, how would you just label that or summarize that in a phrase or two? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, the term that I, that I settled on to describe resurrection is, is a culmination. Um, you know, and so like there, the scripture categorically states we are sons of God. But then John goes on and says, but it, it, we haven't yet seen what will appear because when we see him, we'll be like him because we'll see him as he is. And that's, that seems to be talking about, we're talking about seeing him. We're talking about material part. And so I have no problem with saying we categorically are sons of God in a very full sense, but there's also a future aspect to it. Um, like I would say we're sons of God, but we don't yet have 
the full nature of God's sons. The material part of that nature is, is yet to come. And even the immaterial part is being restored and will be culminated when we, when we enter God's presence. Um, so we categorically have the relationship. It's just the nature of God's sons is still partial. I mainly ask this because you never use the term or the framework, the conceptual framework. But I mean, a lot of what I was hearing with that type of question, how would we describe the distinction of my present versus my future is like uh, mm -hmm. soteriological already not yet kind of mm -hmm. thing. Is that is that fair? Is the same same framework? Would you use that framework or you would you view yeah. it as something different? Yeah. 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 And I think that's what you see in in Romans 8 is you see a contrast between present and future and Paul paints that contrast as a as a contrast between immaterial and material. Um, so yeah, already not yet would be would be a fair way of would be a fair framework for for understanding that. Yeah. Okay, I have like two more and then other questions might come in. I'll try to go fast here. Um, so, okay, I, I mean, I was intrigued by the whole, I was, I'm very intrigued by the whole framework because it explains some pieces that otherwise have always seemed to me kind of disparate and odd. Um, you know, even when I teach, recently teaching through it, uh, what does it mean, sonship and these kinds of things. In I'm teaching this like on a college level and then on a master's degree level. Um, I don't know. I mean, I present the data and I present a framework, but there's still pieces of it. People are just kind of looking at back at me like, and it's kind of like, why, why would God have chosen this? Why did he choose this particular metaphor and such? So there's disparate pieces like that that are kind of left hanging out there. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of your framework is pulling some of those pieces together in a way I haven't heard before. Question I have, uh, historical theology, are you finding... Are you finding other people that, how, how solid do you feel about historical theology and finding other people that are doing similar yeah. things with the way that you're putting sure. pieces together? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, when it comes to the question of Adam being created in a filial relationship to God, that's, I found several students of historical theology who categorically stated that that was the prevailing view of the church until the rise of liberalism and the universal fatherhood of God. And then in, in, um, uh, in, in um, what would you say repudiation of that of that liberal idea? Then they started denying um, Adamic sonship um, and and saying that there's no sense in which we're sons of God prior to conversion. Um, you know, but I, I think the fall explains uh, or is the mechanism for explaining that Adam was created as a son of God, and yet um, we stand in need of sonship. Uh, and I think that's what, what the scriptures do. Um, so on, on that point, I got into historical theology and, and the debate a little bit. Um, when it comes to understanding, uh, you know, you've got like, I think it was, it was Irenaeus had kind of a recapitulation of Adam theory. And so there's a little bit of a flavor there. Um, but when it comes to explaining like this framework, you know, I'm I'm not really aware of anybody who really, um, who really would have stated it quite like I stated. It. Yeah, if that makes sense. So it, in that sense, it was very, um, very new. So yeah. Which I mean, it's a dissertation, so it's, you want to do original work and original contribution. So that's yeah. part of the point of it. Um, yeah. And some of these things, a nice thing about a dissertation, I guess, you, you can throw out some things as kind of like a hypothesis. Or, I mean, mm -hmm. by the time you get done spending four years or two years or whatever on something, you're no longer feeling like it's a hypothesis. But you can toss things out to the conversation and see how yeah. see how people react. Um, yeah. uh, one guy was asking here, when Paul says you put on the new man, which is created after God and righteousness and true holiness, how would this fit into your scheme? Mm -hmm. This is yeah, like I mean, the I Ephesians 4 concept. Yeah, I think he's talking about their the the regeneration, sanctification, glorification part. I mean, he's talking about transformation of the inner man. He's talking about righteousness and moral holiness. And there was a, a definitely a moral aspect to the image um, that pertained to the to the inner man. And Paul's talking about that. Um, you know, Peter talks about becoming partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. And I think he's talking about, um, about this restoration of, 
of our the extent to which God chose for humans to participate in his nature via the image. Um, but I would explain that passage in Paul as being um, about sanctification and the immaterial part of man. Okay, um, last. So you talked about this from the perspective of biblical theology. <laughs> I'm interested in this, the, the interface between biblical and systematic theology. And the irony that is that as we start working with biblical theology, the more we work with it and then we start making correlations and putting pieces together and drawing lines and drawing patterns and, you know, putting things into frameworks, biblical theology turns into systematic theology mm -hmm. and it just sort of, <laughs> it just kind of moves across. Um, so yeah. by the time you got to the point of all of the framework, is it still biblical theology or has it, has it become systematic theology now? What do you think? <laughs> How would you answer somebody who, who yeah. challenged you on that? Well, I realized about halfway through the dissertation, it would have been a whole lot easier to do it in reverse because I'm looking at the New Testament and asking questions where Paul brings two things together and I'm asking, what do they have to do with each other? And then I go back to the Old Testament and I find out, oh, that, that's why they have to do with each other. And so like I would, yeah, I mean, I would explain my dissertation as, as ending up very systematic theological. Um, but I think, um, uh, you know, what, what Paul's doing there is he's building off of the Old Testament. Um, and I, I would explain that as, as fair biblical theology to say, you know, what's Paul's understanding of the Old Testament in what he's saying in the New Testament, um, you know. And, and I kind of, you know, I mean, I wrestled with this, to what extent do I allow Paul's connections to shape the understanding of like Genesis 2? Um, but like, I, I would put, I would put what they do with We at the Sea in the category of, of systematic theology, um, where you're bifurcating sonship into, um, into an adoption idea and then a, a, a a broader theology of sonship of birth idea and there's these two different models and so then you approach every passage asking which model is it going to fall into you know like I would look at that as being a systematic theological construct that you brought to bear on the passage whereas I'm looking at the passage and just saying all right so what's Paul actually saying we have to see it is and and what Old Testament allusions is he making um, and uh, and it, it ends up being you know it ends up moving towards systematic theology um, but I, I would classify myself, particularly from that Huitasia standpoint, as being far more biblical theological than than the approach that most people take. And and again, that cornerstone Huitasia concept is what sends them in a particular direction right from the start. Um, and I would look at that as a systematic theological construct that just isn't supported in the text. So, so that would be how I'd respond, I guess. Great. Yeah. This is great. Uh, my, my head hurts and um, I need to go through and spend time in your dissertation. I need time to kind of absorb and get a couple more passes at it. Uh, this is this is good. It's a lot, of, a lot of work here. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, yeah. If guys want to interact with you, is it okay if I pass along your email, if they want to send questions mm -hmm. or just interact back and forth and that kind of thing? Does that work? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I'd love that. I guess yeah. asked like that, what are you going to say? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, I, um, I, I'm very conscious of the fact that I've barely begun to think about this and other people's help is very, very much appreciated. So. Well, uh, yeah. you've thought about it a lot and you made us think tonight. So great. Excellent. We better go. We're over time. Thank you everyone for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Minnick for your time. And we look forward to seeing you all back on Thursday. So very good. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.